Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, this is terrific. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, tonight and to share with you what I think will be uh, three stories. Three stories about uh, how you go about um, creating places of uh, innovation, places where people want to come, share ideas, um, move ideas forward. Uh, create a better world and a better life for all of us. Um, and I, I begin my story tonight with um, a little walk around that I did here at Centennial Campus. Uh, so I was a, a graduate uh, in 1987. That actually was the centennial year of NC State University. And it was the year in which Centennial Campus was founded. And uh, so I know this project very well. In fact, I was in the College of Design um, with a dean. Claude McKinney. Do any of you know the name Claude McKinney? Claude McKinney was the visionary behind Centennial Campus. And I remember as a student, several of us, he would invite us into his office uh, to look at pictures of this project, this vision he had for a place called Centennial Campus. It was going to be unlike any other research park or campus in the world. It was going to be a place where industry, university, and government would come together sharing common buildings, plazas, courtyards. It would be a place where we would have a golf course and conference center. It would be a place where people would live and work. And everybody thought Claude was completely nuts. In fact, I remember very clearly the number of faculty at the College of Design who mocked Claude's vision for Centennial Campus. But there were plenty of people within the administration, including the chancellor at the time, Bruce Poulton, who believed Claude had a really innovative idea. And they let Claude take that idea and run with it. Now, I had the privilege of working with Claude later in my career um, as I began working in the area of how research campuses come together and how they're fashioned. Um, and I remember, um, I remember Claude going to visit faculty on the main campus, and the faculty would say to him, Claude, we will never drive all the way over to Centennial Campus to have classes. The students will never go there. I remember when they started building buildings over here, the faculty said, but Claude, why are you building new buildings over at Centennial Campus when we have old buildings over here that need renovating? And Claude would say, I I've tried building old buildings at Centennial Campus. It just doesn't work. I can only build new buildings. <laughs> Claude had an amazing uh, amount of courage, tremendous passion, and patience. And he, stu and he, stuck, with, he, he stuck with this idea even after 10 years, 10 years of development Centennial. <clears throat> They'd begun to build infrastructure, <clears throat> put in some of the initial buildings. Claude was out well before PowerPoints with an old slide projector and, and boards under his arm giving pitches all over town. And, um, and, <clears throat> at, and at one point, 10 years into the development, uh, the News and Observer ran the headline story, The Moribund Centennial Campus, and basically said Centennial would never work. It was a failure. They asked Claude when he was going to give it up. He never did. So to walk this campus today, to see, um, to see all of you here on this campus, to see residential going up, to see what was in Claude's mind all the way back in 1987, and to see it a reality today is remarkable. I travel the world, and when you mention North Carolina, people know Research Triangle Park, but more and more people know of this Centennial Campus. It is a model for the modern university research park and campus in the world. And it all came about because someone said, what, what if we could do something really great together? What if we could come up with, what if we could push the boundaries 
of how we think about working, how about how, uh, the way in which students learn, the way in which industry supports and collaborates with education. That was Claude McKinney. He asked those questions and he pushed those boundaries and Centennial Campus is where it is today. Uh, there's a wonderful plaque here on the campus to commemorate Claude if you ever get a chance to see it. It's just outside on the research, research one, two, and three buildings. There's a lovely little courtyard there and there's a plaque that honors Claude McKinney. You should check it out sometime. He's a great guy. What gave Claude the courage to do a Centennial Campus? It, it wasn't just that, that Claude was who Claude was, it was where Claude lived. It's what Claude knew about the history of North Carolina and about another project that just 25 years before had been the Big Bet. Research Triangle Park was called North Carolina's Big Bet. In 1950s, uh, North Carolina was 49th out of the 50 states. The, the motto in North Carolina was thank God for Mississippi because they were the only state lower than we were. In almost every measure, by the way, we, we were not poised in any way coming out of the Second World War to take advantage of any of the new technologies. North Carolina was destined to be an old line, agriculture, manufacture, southern state. Except that some people want, had a different idea. Now the governor at the time was a governor named Luther Hodges. Luther Hodges had worked with General Marshall in the rebuilding of Europe. So he understood the importance of making big decisions and pushing forward big ideas. And he partnered up with a group of business leaders to take uh, several thousand acres of scrub pine forest among three good universities. We weren't great universities back then like we are today. NC State, Duke, and UNC were good universities, well respected. And the decision was, to carve out this land and to announce to the world that North Carolina, the state at the near the bottom, was going to create the largest research park in the world. Now at the time there was only other, one other research park model anywhere and that was in Stanford University. Uh, the other models were growing up around Boston. So this was indeed our big bet. The New York Times called it that and it was very risky. The, the odds of success were slim. But the leaders who put it together believed passionately in the people of North Carolina and their promise. And so uh, they launched this project with great fanfare. And um, I, I, I want to say this to our faculty who may be here because I, always, I think this is a wonderful story. Our faculty became our salesmen for, the, for, for Research Triangle Park. We actually bought them train tickets and on their summer breaks, we sent them out around the country to meet with companies and try to lure them to Research Triangle Park. Well, it, you know, it didn't, it, as big as the fanfare was, it didn't start off with all that much success. And in fact, uh, several years into the operation, the options on the property, they didn't buy the property outright. They were so sure that people would come in and buy property, they just took out options. Well, since no one came in, the options were coming due. Luther Hodges was incredibly nervous because he had made a deal. The deal was he would fund education and infrastructure, but the private sector, the private business leaders who had formed the vision for the park, they were going to have to fund it. So he got on the phone and he called Robert Haynes. Robert Haynes was the president of Wachovia Bank. At that time, Winston-Salem and Wachovia were the biggest places in North Carolina. And Governor Hodges called him and said, look, we have a problem. In about 30 days, we need to raise the money to pay off these options or this whole Research Triangle Park idea is going to be a flop. Um, Robert Haynes was dying of cancer. The amount of money they were talking about is the equivalent of about $15 million in today. Right? So they needed 50, so the equivalent of $15 million and they needed to raise it in 30 days. Robert Haynes turned to a young protege, a guy named Archie Davis. Archie worked there at the bank. He was the son of a prominent family in Winston-Salem. He would later become the president of Wachovia Bank. But at that point, 
he was working for Robert Haynes, and Haynes said, what are we going to do, Archie? Are we going to, do we need to go out and sell stock in this park idea? Um, you know, uh, are we going to have to just float more loans? What are we going to have to do? And Archie said, no, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out and ask the people of North Carolina to contribute the money to pay off these options. So now imagine this. Archie Davis gets in his car and he travels all across North Carolina and he asks private citizens to give money to this idea that no one in the world had ever tried before. He raised every cent from private individuals. My favorite story is the farmer that stopped him at a gas station. He said, I understand you're raising money for this project in Raleigh. Here's $100. I know I'll never see it, but it's for my kids and my grandkids. They, they didn't get anything in return. They bought into a dream, to a promise, to an idea. Archie Davis said, from that point on, what would, what would be the mark of Research Triangle Park would be its generosity of spirit. And they turned Research Triangle Park from a for-profit real estate venture into a not-for-profit economic development program. And if you look at our mission statement, it doesn't say a thing about real estate. It says we have three goals, to support our universities, create jobs, and help lift up all the people of the state of North Carolina. So when you drive through Research Triangle Park, when you think about what it means, know this, it was, it's your park. The people of North Carolina believed in it. They invested money in it out of their own pockets. They took a chance. And even though the park would flounder a few more years, ultimately it all paid off, and in a huge way. Today, as was said, the park is 7,000 acres. We're half the size of the island of Manhattan. 170 companies, 40, 50,000 people on any given day show up there for work. Here's what's even more interesting, other than all the big names you know at the park. More than 50% of the companies at the park are 20 employees or less. But you didn't realize that. It's a great place for small companies, startup companies, innovative new companies to land. And it still ranks among the world's most innovative public-private partnerships and has a great global brand for North Carolina. It absolutely changed our state's destiny. And I can tell you that for a fact because I lived it. My father was a working class electrician. We lived here in Raleigh. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. And I remember distinctly my father putting us, the only thing he had of value was a 1965 Ford Mustang, black with red interior. It was a sweet little car. Uh, that's the only thing we had of real value. And he'd get us in the car and he would drive out to this place called Research Triangle Park. I remember it, I think, because back then we only had two parks, Pullen Park and Umstead Park. And so we'd go to Pullen Park, I mean, we'd go to Research Triangle Park. There was nothing to do but look at all these places where big buildings and, 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 and Red Earth was being developed. Here's what happened. My father believed that that park would be some, would provide some greater opportunity for him and his kids. What happened as the years went on is my father went from being a working class electrician to getting a job at Motorola. He had nothing but a high school degree, but the, part, the triangle was growing. Companies like Motorola were coming in. He could become a salesman, which is what he did. We went from working class to middle class. We moved into a new neighborhood along with people who were moving from all kinds of bizarre places like Schenectady, New York, and you know, all the places where the IBM employees were coming from and moving in to Raleigh. And, and so I saw you know, and met kids whose parents had college degrees. I saw my public education improve when I went to school. And then when I came to NC State, NC State had gone from a good university to a great university. The faculty, the programs, the research, everything that was happening here had been influenced by the park. Our politics in our state had changed. The way we thought about ourselves as North Carolinians had changed. We believed we were a state with a great destiny. 
that we were a state that could do big things. If we, at the bottom of the pile, 49th, if we could choose to change our course, then there was nothing we couldn't do. And I think it was reflected in our, in our, in our, in our modern history. If you look at North Carolina and where it has grown and how it has prospered. And as I pointed out, it led to the courage of a Claude McKinney and an NC State University to pursue a bold vision like a Centennial Campus. So we, we've been at challenging places before, and we're at, at a challenging place again. We are seeing enormous global competition. There are research parks all over the world. I just visited China. I was there for two weeks. In China alone, the research parks are practically the size of North Carolina. I mean, they're huge. Tremendous investments going in in Malaysia, in places called Biopolis. So we are seeing tremendous competition in the area of innovation and technology. Uh, places where people will want to go and, and create and think and do amazing things. So we know that we're at another challenging place. So we have um, begun an effort at Research Triangle Park that we call Redevelop, Reconnect, and Reimagine. Let me begin with the redevelopment. Research Triangle Park was designed in, uh, in the 1960s, and the idea was that dad would live in the suburbs and go to this suburban office park where their company would provide cafeterias and gyms or whatever, and the park was never planned with any of the kind of amenities and services we, we all want today. Imagine this again, we're 7,000 acres, half the size of the island of Manhattan, and you can't buy a Starbucks coffee anywhere in Research Triangle Park. We may be the only urban center in the world that's 7,000 acres where you can't buy a Starbucks. So we are seeing our existing companies in the park say to us, look, we're investing here, we're growing here, we want to stay here, but something has to change. Our employees have to be able maybe to live closer, we have to have access to food, good coffee, um, and, 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 and so, and the newer companies that are coming in are saying, we're going to have a hard time recruiting people like you. They're not going to want to work at mom and dad's old office park. Something's got to change. So with all those challenges, when we take on the redevelopment, we're completely rethinking the way in which the park looks and feels today. We've set out four goals for the redevelopment. First is that whatever we create needs to be highly collaborative. You understand a collaborative environment because Centennial Campus was designed this way. Our design and feel will be different, but the idea will be the same. How do we create places where people can get together, share ideas, be comfortable? Right now, you can't do that in the park. Whatever we design in Research Triangle Park needs to be authentic. It needs to have a great look and a feel, but it doesn't need to try to look like Centennial or downtown Durham or Raleigh or Austin or Boston or you know, Abu Dhabi, wherever it might be. We need a look and a feel that suits us. So we've reached out to some of the world's best architects, artists, and planners to create a look and feel for RTP that will be like none other. This last summer, I went to three interesting locations. I began in Boston to look around the MIT Cambridge Innovation Center, a great place for technology innovation. Then I went to um, Silicon Valley, which we all know, around Stanford University. And then I visited the Imagineering Studios for Walt Disney in Glendale, California. So I start off in Boston. It has everything that everybody says you all want, right? It's very dense, urban, fun, great food, lots of beer, great coffee. Um, everything's right there. And you leave Boston going, OK, well, that's what everybody wants. Then you go out to Stanford, and you see people just like you, but in a completely different environment. It's completely suburban. I mean, Stanford Research Park looks just like Research Triangle Park. But people are there. They're there in numbers. And they're there because there's a great culture of risk taking, and there's a lot of money in venture capital. It's another unique place. And then you go to these Imagineering studios. OK, I'm a big Walt Disney fan. I think he's one of the most inspiring developers, creators. Just, just, I, I, just, I think Walt Disney was set the standard for modern uh, placemaking. So I went to the Imagineering studios in Glendale. And you pull up, and, it, and there's nothing inspiring about it at all. 
The, the, they're staying in the same warehouses that Walt Disney picked out himself for them in the 1950s, around the same time the park was started. Now you go inside, it's incredible. It's like Walt Disney's attic in there. I mean, it's just like all this amazing stuff. But you talk to them about collaboration. So I sat down with about a dozen Imagineers, and I said, talk to me about how you collaborate. They said, oh, we're terrible at it. They had to put a Starbucks in here so we'd start meeting together and spending time with each other. But they wouldn't work anywhere else. For them, the unique environment is all about the brand. For them, they would only want to work with the Walt Disney Corporation. So what that tells us is it's not necessarily about urbanity. It's about unique and special places. So at our redevelopment, what we have to create is something authentic that is unique and special. It could be all about the park. It could be all about, uh, it could be all about sustainability. It could all be about all a technology showcase. But it needs to be unique and special to drive people like you to think about wanting to work there. The third thing it needs to have is it needs to have and, and represent something of great inspiration. It's not an inspiring place today. Look, I work there. I get lost there some days when I'm driving around. I mean, you arrive at RTP, you don't know where you were, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. We need a place in the park <coughs> where people can come together and you can get a sense of what the future has to offer. There was an NPR uh, series, this last uh, NPR radio series, uh, this last summer about the Jetsons gener generation. So, right, that's people like me who grew up watching the Jetsons, which, you know, you guys have seen the Jetsons, right? You know what the Jetsons are. They were the opposite of the Flintstones, right? They were all about the future. And for those of us who grew up watching the Jetsons generation, we're excited about the future, right? We're all waiting for our little cars in the sky, and we, I mean, we just love the future. But you know what's interesting? Those of you who aren't the Jetsons generation, according to all the professionals, you don't see the future quite so optimistically. Right? You see the future as a little darker than folks like me. One of the things I want to do with RTP is create a place where we can showcase what the, what the future promises, how exciting it could be, how we can impact it, how we can make it brighter. So we believe RTP needs to be inspiring, needs to tell that story. And finally, what we create needs to be as accessible and as affordable as possible. We want to throw out all the old real estate rule books. No long-term leases, no big high fit-up costs. We want space where you can get in and move ideas. It all is about idea flow, right? So no buildings with marble, ferns, and fountains. It's going to be simple per space that you can get into easily. No barriers. That's what we want to create, a place of no barriers whatsoever to bring you in. So that's our redevelopment. That's where we're going. You will see more about the redevelopment in the coming months because we're working like crazy to get something out of the ground. The second part is reconnecting. Because RTP can never just be about the land. It has to be about you, what you want, what you believe in, what your passions are. So we traveled all around North Carolina. We got in a bus. We did a Pathways to Opportunity Tour. We traveled around and we visited over 22 communities in North Carolina, and we asked them the question, what great things can we do together? And they said, we want, we want RTP to, they all said to us, we want RTP to do something big, right? That North Carolina, as I said, is a place that likes to do big things. What's our next big idea? Who's going to come up with that? So as we reconnect, as we talk to our universities about how we're going to work close, more closely, as we open up to students and say, please, Give us ideas about the park's future. Help us shape it. As we reach out to economic development professionals, as we talk to people around the world, we want to connect with them and open up a conversation so that the park is never finished. The park is always in a state of becoming, always transforming, always forever changing. That's what reconnecting is all about. And the big idea then becomes the whole reimagining phase. And here's what we did with reimagining. We turned to our universities, we turned to our friends at NC State and Duke and UNC and we said, if we created something in the park that would be of great value to you, would it be? And we began to imagine a place we call Project Archie, after Archie Davis, right? And this, and this idea is that there would be a place of amazing architecture and in that place the universities would come together to work on the world's biggest problems. So whether it's issues with transformational medicine or big data or water inequality or food distribution, 
NC State, UNC, and Duke, and by the way, we've included now the other public and private universities across North Carolina, will send their best thinkers to come and work on these global problems together. And then there'll be a part of Archie where those big ideas and other ideas that we collect will be shared through a network across North Carolina so that we can reach out to the places in North Carolina that are struggling the very most. There are communities and families and towns all across our state right now that don't have any idea what their future offers them. We have an obligation, a responsibility. Again, our charter, our mission says to lift up the people. So we want to get ideas out to them, to connect with them, to give them hope, to open up something we call an Archie's Fellow Program. So the most innovative young person from every county in North Carolina can come to the Research Triangle Park and, get, and, and, and develop mentors and, and, uh, and uh, work with companies and get connected with universities. That's another part of Archie, an economic development piece that is like no other in the world, that is built around relationships. The third piece is around a convening space. We don't have a space like this in the Triangle. We need a place where we can do TEDx conferencing. We need a place where you could walk in and get access to a black box studio, where you could do YouTube studio events. We need, we need an amazing convening space in the Triangle where, where an innovative entrepreneur can launch their product and they don't have to go to New York or Boston or San Francisco to do that. You ought to be able to do that right at Research Triangle Park. And then finally, the part about Archie that I'm most excited about. Again, I'm a, I'm a Walt Disney guy, right? Walt Disney had a vision for a place called Epcot, later became an amusement park. But the original idea behind Epcot, and go to YouTube, look up Walt Disney Epcot presentation, and you'll see him talk about a place where science and technology would constantly be on display, where the best and brightest of new innovations would be someplace where you could go and visit and see them. Well, we want to create that kind of technology showcase. Yeah, there would be pl a place, a physical place you could walk through, but it would also be connected to the way the storefronts work, the way the lighting works, the way the sustainability works. It would be a constant changing and evolving showcase for the best of what our young people and our, our great minds around the country can imagine. So this is the project we call Archie, and I'm very pleased to say that our great chancellor here at NC State, Randy Woodson, has fully endorsed it, as has Carol Fort at UNC Chapel Hill, as has Dick Broadhead at Duke, as has Tom Ross, the president of UNC System. In fact, Tom Ross told me two weeks ago that Project Archie is not just the future of North Carolina, it's the future of the UNC System. Because this idea of convergence, of bringing together science, technology, arts, and humanities is the future. And there is no place with the history, with the brand, and the reputation of RTP that can make it happen. But we have to do it with all of you. So, um, you know, what I hope in our conversation tonight and in the conversation I hope you will have with us in the future, whether you stay here or move a million miles away, Research Triangle Park is your park. It will always be something we want you to be connected to. And we want you to help us as we think about that future. It's our obligation. It's our responsibility to that kid out there whose parents aren't sure what future they have. So um, I hope you will join us on that mission. And as Walt Disney used to say, let's keep moving forward. That's our plan. So I'm glad to share it with you. And I'll be glad to take any questions or comments that any of you may have. Yes, sir. Uh, so like that technology showcase thing yeah. you um, Right. It could be, look, it, the idea is completely open. I mean, I think part of what's exciting is to see that evolution, to see how quickly ideas are, are changing before our very eyes. And um, so uh, what it can become, what it will be, is, is still evolving and changing. It certainly could. We don't want it to become a static museum. The idea is not that you would go there and see the same thing over and over again, but there would be something constantly evolving. And it might have elements to it where there is uh, places where you could, uh, you know, there, there might be places where people can play and learn and engage. It should be, the goal is that it would be just as interesting to an advanced PhD 
as to a mom with two single kids from Bertie, you know, a single mom with two kids from Bertie County who wants to come and get them excited about their future. Yes, ma'am. You know, I don't, I, don't, <coughs> I don't believe that ever, I don't believe that anything ever stops evolving and changing. You know, I think that um, as long as our region, and, and I think this is the key, as long as our region and our state continue to invest in education, K through 12, community colleges, and, and higher education, as long as we have talented, smart um, uh, people uh, in this state, uh, we'll have great ideas. And the park will it continue to evolve and change. It may, at some point, the, pa the park may be not even viewed as a place within certain boundaries. It may, be it may be something that is just evolved into our cities, and it just may be something that's all part of one, uh, one large region. But I, I, I'm an optimist. I, I, I believe there's, um, that, that everything continues to evolve and change for the better. And I guess the follow-up to that would be, you know, I, m my father, you know, I grew up, my dad worked at IBM. Yeah, RCC, sure. Right. So do, you, do you have anything in place knowing that a lot of these big employers have such a big remote workforce now? You know, right. you were talking about making it more of a collaborative area as well. Do you still plan? You know, yeah, here's what's interesting about RTP that most people don't know. I mean, it, it has evolved um, even in the last 25 years from, um, from a time when RTP was largely viewed as IT, telecommunications, and networking. There was one point where Cisco was going to buy all the rest of the Research Triangle Park property, right? Um, that didn't happen, and that shifted from that industry focus to more of a biopharmaceutical focus. Today, it's really ag and life and biosciences. What drives that? Market conditions, certainly, but I'll tell you what also drives it. What drives it is the, the particular leadership, skills, and programs coming out of our universities. Um, so. Where those strengths are drives a lot of what happens in the park. Now what we're trying to do is create greater diversity in the park so we're not as reliant only on the big, on certain big companies, right? So that if, um, if IBM changes and evolves, and they will, as Glaxo changes and evolves and they will, there will be other companies that will grow and change around them. I, I, I really suspect in the future it will be less about big companies It'll just be around, it'll be around innovation or thought industries. And it won't matter whether those are a dozen people or 250 people. That, I mean, I, here at Centennial Campus, one of the stories I tell is that we recruited Lucent Technologies here. Many of you won't remember Lucent, but at the time Lucent was one of the country's uh, great technology innovation companies, came out of Bell Labs. We recruited them to Centennial Campus, and within about a year, their stock plummeted, and they left their new building, right? But we had a big event for Lucent when they came here. It was amazing, right? Chancellor showed up, Secretary of Commerce, the governor came here, right? Year and a half, two years later, Lucent's gone. Another company showed up at the same time that no one went to their opening. The company was called Red Hat. And Red Hat, <laughs> Red Hat ended up moving into the Lucent building right here at Centennial Campus. You just never know. So you need to make sure you create great diversity, and that's one of the things we're focused on at the park. Yes, sir. How do you think you can help influence the DC community, like what uh, is happening around campus? You know, this is the question we ask ourselves every day. I, I think it's one of the great challenges we face, and I don't know anybody who knows the answer. We, um, we, know, that, we know that part of the answer is making the triangle more accessible to the VC community. And of course, uh, I think uh, we've done a good job by opening up some new flights, direct flights between here and the West Coast. The other thing we hear is that, <laughs> that it's all about deal flow, that we're gonna have to see greater deal flow, uh, greater, new tech, uh, a greater surplus of new technology companies in order for VCs to find the triangle more attractive. Now, there's not much I can do about that other than create the kinds of spaces and places and leverage the park to get to, so, that, so that we can see more of those kinds of deals created. Um, the, um, the, the, we, the third thing we, we talk about is something that's game changing, something that will be unlike anything else in the marketplace. So if you go to Boston, of course VCs are in Boston anyway, but they all huddle around this Cambridge Innovation Center because it was a new model. 
Now, so we see in Archie an opportunity to create something where um, there, isn't, there isn't another place in the world, believe me, we've looked hard, there isn't another place in the world where three great universities work together on global research and where they're in the same space there would be open tables, open labs, no barriers to uh, uh, innovative technology companies and entrepreneurs. You create that kind of environment, it may not be all that it takes, but, it, but it's one more element in terms of catching their attention. It's a, it's a real challenge that we're, we're facing. Um, and I know it's a political issue uh, for our governor, he's working very hard. Uh, we're looking for new ways to find capital to do that. Other questions? Yes, sir. So, as you're investing to create new spaces, are you trying to invest with companies to recreate their existing spaces to kind of create <coughs> that collaborative environment, even within like massive companies like Cisco or IBM? Right. So, um, it, well, each of them is approaching it differently, but um, in the case of um, uh, Glaxo, uh, they have just spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in a new plan that will tie in their development with our new development, and it includes all the things we're talking about. They're, so they're, what, what we're seeing is companies aren't expanding space, but they're spending money in their existing space. They're taking out all the old cubicles, all the old lighting, they're creating a whole new open, flexible environment. Uh, Fidelity, which is key to this conference, Fidelity has just renovated an old building and did a beautiful job with that, creating those kinds of open spaces. We're actually seeing in the park, we've seen in the last five years, a little over a billion dollars invested in the current facilities by the current owners. Um, we're also seeing projects like Syngenta out in the park um, has a, if, if you drive out there at night, you can see it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's this incredible uh, greenhouse that can duplicate all of the climates of the world in that one greenhouse. They also, we have Bear out there who has a wonderful bee facility. We have BASF which has an insect zoo. So we have, we have some ingre, incredible assets that are growing out there. Now we, we link those with IBM's work in Smarter Planet, Smarter Cities. Um, we link that with the work that Cisco is doing in, in, uh, uh, in data management. Um, we link, we, what we're doing is trying to look and con, link and converge all of those new technologies. Yes, sir. RPT has a lot of big companies, but uh, what do you need to do for encouraging a Silicon Valley kind of startup culture? You know, <clears throat> look, I think, well, we know, we know capital is a part of it, his question. We need more venture capital, so when you take the risk, you have an idea, someone's going to help you fund it, right? So we know we need capital. The other, the, the other thing we can do is help reduce your risk. A big risk factor for a lot of companies is all about space. The reason the Cambridge Innovation Center in Boston has been working so well is because you could walk in the door, you sign a piece of paper, you've not signed a long-term lease, you don't, have to, you don't have to do any fit up, right? You simply walk in, they look at what your needs are, you get assigned a space, you pay an amount for that, it's not gonna go up, if you need to cancel, you cancel. But in that space, they've got kitchens, conference rooms, places where you can engage and meet other people, right? So we want to we want to create a whole a, a whole I hate to use ecosystem it's server use, but we want to create a whole ecosystem that's like that, and we want to create buildings and spaces where it's very easy for you to get in. You want to remove those barriers. So if you have an idea, you get in. That helps keep your costs low and your risk factors low. Now, if we can also bring into that venture capital. That's terrific as well. We also know you're going to need access to talent, and that's why we continue to talk up the need for continued investments in higher education in our universities, right? We've got to make sure that the talent pool coming out of our universities remains strong. Otherwise, RTP or Centennial Campus or any of these parts, they won't work ultimately because it's the brain power that drives them, not the land deals. Yes, sir. Sure. I mean, it's, 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 it's not so much about worried about one company and the culture. It's just a basic portfolio question. I mean, anyone would tell you that for, you know, to have long-term financial viable strength, you want a more diverse portfolio. I don't think there's a risk. 
based on the current way in which we're seeing industries invest in R&D facilities or in new facilities of somebody coming in and, and taking up a third of RTP, for instance. What we're seeing today is most companies are going away from the big R&D centers. They're doing what we call pop-up R&D. So if you have a company today, instead of locating and investing in one big center, instead they might say, well, where's the best place in the world for me to go to work on this drug development? And they just pop up a lab and go there. So what we want to create is we want to create an environment where it's easy for them to pop up those labs there with the belief that once they do that, they're going to want to stay. We won't get all of them, but we'll get, we'll get some of them, and, and they'll stay here. So we want to create, again, a very flexible environment for that. That will create a great diversity, and I don't think there will be a chance of one company or one type of culture ultimately dominating the park. Yes, ma'am. Um, with creating a space in RTP for people to come together, are there plans for attracting companies there and people there, or is the expectation that once it's there, people will just come? Well, <clears throat> You know, you never, you never can quite do that. I'm not in real estate, but I'm in real estate. You know, so part of it is I have to create something that people can see that's real, right? And so uh, I've developed with a, a company called Heinz, which is probably H-I-N-E-S, which is one of the best development companies in the world. And the part of their deal, I will put the land into the project and they will start building. Right? So in order to make something like we want to make happen, we need, we, need, um, we need all of it almost coming out of the ground at one time. So what we envision in our first phase is about somewhere around 200 to 300,000 square feet of retail, mostly food and beverage. And we're very focused, by the way, on authentic local places. We don't want a lot of chains. We want to be very cool, very funky, very... Um, uh, real to where we live. So about two to 300,000 square feet of retail, about a million square feet of office space, all this very flexible and affordable space. And then we want, um, we have about a 250 guest room hotel, this new convening center with Archie. And, um, and then we want, um, let's see, what am I missing? I said, uh, oh, and about 2,000 residential units so that people can live and do all of those things on this new property. But instead of it looking like a typical sort of new town center that you've overseen, it'll all be blended in with this park-like setting. So it'll be, be like a collaborative park um, and unlike any in the world. Other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. So uh, you've got all these plans and everything like that. How does a college student, how does a new grad, how does someone who's been here for 20 years get involved to help you try and develop this as we go along. Right, so, right. so we developed, uh, when we went out and we, we traveled around the state, we created a whole web portal um, that allows people to come on and participate, one, in our virtual communities. So there are ways to connect with us on and blogs and Twitters, and we do a variety of social and media events uh, that you can participate online or in person. Tonight, as a matter of fact, we have this thing called RTP 180. It sells out every single time. Tonight, the, the topic is food. Um, I've, I've, heard <coughs> I've heard they've got people out the door trying to get in. It's like a TEDx event. You can come in. You get like five or ten minutes to sort of do your story. And it's become wildly popular. And so there's a lot of people who now connect with us in that way. You can also go on to the site and, be give a, and, be, and, and get updates on the development and when there's activities in the park or where we're going so that you can come and give us feedback on our plans. And then we load them up and I do little videos talking about where certain things are going and how we're planning it. And then people write to us or send us video clips back of how they think that looks and how that's going. So we want to create you know, both of, 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 of a, virtual, a virtual relationship with as many people uh, as want to participate and then give them enough information of how they can physically come. And then people can volunteer. And we accept volunteers and we use them for all kinds of things, right? We use, them for, we, we use volunteers for events, for planning, for helping us think about transit and smart cars and pods. So we want this to be something that the people own. Uh, we, well, RTP, rtp.org, go to the webpage, and then you'll see a thing called Connect With Us, and there's Pathways to Opportunity. 
you go through that and that's where you would connect. Sorry. All right. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, criticisms? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Yeah.